Merry Christmas. Glad to be here. You say Merry Christmas? Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Yes. Starting the new series, as Al said, The Miracles of Christmas. I'll be talking about the miracle of the message today. And uh, speaking of Christmas, you probably heard the story, right? The guy who bought his wife a diamond ring, a big diamond ring. And his buddy said, wait a minute, I thought she wanted one of those four-wheel drive sporty type of things. And the husband said, she did, but, you know, where am I going to find a fake Jeep? <laughs> it's taken a while. Laughter here, and they'll figure that out, right? So really, the husband was not listening to his wife. <laughs> we'll find that. Statistics will say that. Matter of fact, thinking of Christmas, are we listening during this Christmas season? There's a lot of stuff happening Christmas, putting decorations up talking to your neighbors, listening to your favorite shows. A lot of stuff is bombarding us, and how do, well do we listen? So some statistics about listening in general. How much time do people, between all the stuff, the conversations at work, talking to your spouse, takes a huge amount of time? It's not a physical effort, but it's kind of a mental effort when you try to listen to people. How much time do people spend listening? Listen to this. People spend between 70 to 80% of their day engaged in some sort of communication. 55% of that is devoted to listening. You just got to listen to people. What's the average speaking rate? My wife says I talk too quick, but this is 125 to 175 words per minute. That's how fast people can talk. How many words are, uh, can you listen per minute? 450. Okay? How much can we absorb? About 17 to 25% of all the stuff you're listening to can you really actually hear and understand? Now, this statistic I think is wrong, but I'll say it. Are men or women better listeners? <laughs> research, you know, research shows that men only use half their brain when listening. <laughs> and women are fully engaged with their whole brain. I think that uh, women, what do you say? Yeah. Amen. Okay. <laughs> so we con constantly need to be listening to each other, but this season we need to be listening to the message, the message that I'm going to give you today. So Hebrews chapter 1, if you have your Bibles in front of you, that'd be great. Or if you have it in a tablet or on your phone, do that. Hebrews chapter 1, 1 through 3. We'll be looking at the book of Hebrews, but I want to show you kind of, we, sometimes we jump into a passage or jump into a book. We don't know where we are. Hebrews is in the back of your Bible. If you have a, a hardcover Bible, it's in the back. And I'll just kind of do an overview of Hebrews real quick. Hebrews is, is a book written to uh, former Jewish people that have trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. This is the first century. We don't know the author of this uh, book, but he's talking to Hebrews. He's talking to Israelites. He's talking to Jews. And they're discouraged. Persecution is happening. And they're like, hey, remember when we were Jews, we could follow the law. We kind of knew what we had to do. Now Christianity comes in. And Christianity is tough, tough to follow. And Jesus is gone. And so they're kind of debating at this time. And that's why the author says, hey, hang in there. Hang in there if you're discouraged. There is a better person in chapter 4. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the law. He's better than all that Old Testament stuff you did, which was important that got Christ at this point. But he's saying he's a better person than that. Jesus is a better priest. Some of you grew up in a Catholic background or where there was a priest and you had to confess your sins to him and then he would confess or he would take your sins to God. Right here Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm the better priest. You come directly to me in chapters 5 through 10. And then the last part of the book is more practical, applicational. It says there's a better practice for Christians. So that whole book we're talking about is directed to Jews. So we jump in here and we see that Jesus is superior we see in the first verses that we'll read together, or I'll read, you don't have to read with me. Jesus is, the, is God's final revelation. Revelation is not just a book in the end of the, end of the, end of the Bible. Revelation means to unveil, unveil. And so anybody that tells you they have a revelation, they're unveiling something to you, and you need to listen to it. So the, the author says this, In the past, God the Father spoke to our ancestors. He spoke through the Jewish people. He spoke through the prophets. And the prophets of many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Now, there's a lot of stuff happening in the news today, and people are like, this is the last days. Yes. As soon as Jesus left this earth, you're in the last days. It's 2,000 years until Jesus comes back. I don't know the time. We'll get into that later and some other things. But no one knows the time. So we are in the last days. And he used to speak to the ancestors through what? Dreams. A burning bush 
writing on the wall with Daniel. He spoke in many different ways to convey his message that the Messiah is coming, that Jesus is coming. He spoke to Abraham. He spoke to Moses. He spoke to David through the Psalms, Jeremiah and Jonah and the prophets. Can he do that today? Sure, he's God. He can do anything he wants. But primarily, and if anybody ever talks to you about, hey, someone's talking to you, and God has told me, I would say, hmm, let me listen to it, and take your Bible or your phone that has the Bible on it and read that through the Word of God. If someone says, hey, I have a revelation for you, and this is from God, uh, work it through the Bible first. But God primarily works through his word, and he speaks through his son in the last day, which is in the word. So he makes it very clear, Jesus is just not a prophet. He's just not some other preacher. He is the way. He is the son of God. Now, since our time, uh, 2,000 years of church history, we've had people come up and prophesy and give new revelation. And I want you to be very, very clear and very, very careful when you hear this. About 600 years after Christ, Muhammad said the angel Gabriel appeared to him and dictated him the book known as the Quran. And we're feeling that today, aren't we? We're feeling the, the effects of the Quran or that vision that Mo, Muhammad had. In the 1800s, Joseph Smith said an angel appeared to him and wrote the Book of Mormon, supposedly a new revelation from God. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, a man named the Bab, never heard of him before, said he had a new revelation which teaches that Jesus and Muhammad and all the other religions came from the same place and essentially were all one. Now about these new religions and new prophecies, should we listen to them? No. No. It says in the last days, God the Father will speak through his Son. What Hebrews 1 is telling us that Jesus is the final word on the subject. Like the Mona Lisa, you don't have to add to the Mona Lisa, right? They don't want you to come in with your paintbrush and add to it. It's perfect as it is, if you like art. <laughs> Jesus is saying, don't add anything else to my words. He is the greatest story ever told. We don't have to do that. Listen, there's going to be more false prophets in the last days. Matthew 24, 24 says this, For false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders as to mislead if possible, even to the elect or those who are already believers. You see, Jesus just didn't bring a message. Jesus is the message. Okay? So let's look at the, the first, if you're taking notes. Jesus is God's finest representation. So he was his final revelation, right? There's nothing else to add to it. Then he's his finest representation. Uh, again, Productive Life, real quick, is a training organization that I head up, and we've been doing it for about three years about, we've reached about 7,000 people with the organizations that we partner with. About 1,500 people have volunteered. People from here have come down. Uh, you actually support me as a missionary, which I really appreciate. The whole idea is to get people to serve other people. So we take people to, in Kensington, Philadelphia, South Philly, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic. We take people where there's opportunities where we can all serve. Because I really believe that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So we serve because Jesus meets felt needs. We also serve because we know ultimately the servant was Jesus Christ, and we need to introduce them to Jesus Christ. So we take trips, and um, we take trips, and you have to have your credentials when you take a trip. This is a passport if you can't see it, and my lovely face with a little bit more hair than I have now. But this is my, pa my second passport. And uh, we take trips to um, uh, Costa Rica this last year in Dominican Republic. Costa Rica, we took a bunch of high school students from, uh, from Philly. Uh, they go to International Christian High School. And International Christian High School is a school uh, for kids that uh, have to get scholarships to go there. So they're underprivileged and have some economic needs. So we're going to go to Costa Rica and tell people about Jesus, right? So I'm in the class with them, and there's about 16 students. They said, well, we've got to get a passport because a passport gets you anywhere in the world. If you're an American, it gets you mostly, most people like the Americans around the world. This is gold, baby, gold. And so when I tell them, I said, we got to get a passport. One of the kids said, Dr. Garvin, I don't have a passport. Oh, we'll, we'll get you a passport. And he goes, well, uh, Dr. Garvin, I've never been outside of Philly. I'm like, okay. And I said, okay, dude. He goes, and Dr. Garvin, I've never been on a plane. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> we got a lot of work to do. But I have to realize these guys had to go get passports because this is the credentials that get you in the door. This is the credentials to say who you are. It slips in electronically. You know, you see all these movies where the guy makes a passport. I don't know how they do that. This is really hard to get. So this passport is your credentials. And here's what God the Father says here. 
He says, God, Jesus, uh, Jesus, God's finest representation. He shows his credentials here. He says, this is my son, and these are the credentials to prove that he is who he is. The first one, he says, he's the heir of all things. This is the glorious section that starts this way. And he says, Jesus, my son, is preeminent over all. He will inherit or does inherit all my glory. Some of you have children. Some of you might have a will. We have to change our will twice. And we gave everything to our kids. Um, and they can divide it the way they want. They are our heirs. They inherit our stuff. So this is God the Father saying, here's Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, as he says in Colossians. He is the heir of all things. Secondly, his credential is this one. He made the universe. Now, you have to make this clear. Some people in some prophecies, some religions will say Jesus became God when he came to earth. No, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's always been the Son of God. That is his deity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Trinity is a whole other sermon. But they existed in time past, and then Jesus Christ came down in human form. So in the pre-incarnated uh, form of Jesus Christ, he was God, he is God. When he came to earth, he just inhabited a body. Because there are different thoughts out there that he becomes God like that. And then, you know, eventually we can be become gods, which is another false way of looking at things. So he made the universe. He was involved in the beginning. So was the Holy Spirit. So was the Father. And we use the word aeon here, the Greek word for eon. So he made the material world, and he does that. Third one, the radiance of his glory. Jesus is the brightness of the Father's glory. It pictured this way. Here's the sun, S-U-N. The sun is bright. That's the Father. And the radiant lights that come out from the beams of there are Jesus Christ. That's what he's like. He's part of the Father. He's part of the Trinity. Yet he radiates, and you can't distinguish. You can't pull them apart. So he's the radiance of his glory. If you remember in the times past when God spoke, Sometimes he was a bright light, right? Moses had to shy away from that, or a burning bush, and he was a light. In the New Testament, when Jesus reveals himself to the, uh, to the disciples, right? Moses and Elijah next to him is a bright light, so that's that glory that comes to him. He's the beam and the rays of light. The fourth uh, credential would be he's the exact representation of his being. Again, the idea is the Romans had a ring, and they had their signature on there, and they would use that in the wax thing to say, that's the exact representation of what I do. Or the coin. The coin had Caesar's face on it. That represented Caesar. Same thing here, that Jesus Christ is the exact representation of his Father. So when groups come in to Philly, we, we do food distribution. We uh, work with uh, those in addiction. We uh, do rehab houses. We, do, uh, we have a partnership with an elementary school right around the corner from our ministry center. Uh, we actually got to pray with the principal last week. Um, this is a public elementary school in Philly, in Kensington, and she asked us to come and pray. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> we'll do that for you. And so we prayed with her, and we've got a great inroads. We do recess for them. When they, when they, get, they stay in school like 10 days, they get a recess uh, type of thing, and we get to go and do that. And uh, we also do block parties down there. So we do a lot of things, but one of the things we do when groups come in, and if they're not from Philly, they want to go, go see some sites, right? Now, not the Liberty Bell, not the Constitution Center. They want to go see the Rocky statue <laughs> because that's the exact representation of what Rocky really looked like. Now, if you've seen Stallone in any pictures, he's probably like that tall, right? So this statue is... <laughs> And it's down by the art museum. The kids don't even know it's the art museum. They know it's the Rocky <coughs> Steps. And I have ran the Rocky Steps many times. Now, I'm a little older, so I, we all line up the steps right there. And I go one, two, and I run. And then the three, and then they come after me. And I usually get up there first. The idea is you run the steps that Rocky did in the movie. Now, half these students, some of them are college or high school, they don't even, they've never seen Rocky. I'm like, what? <laughs> and the other half of the older kids are like, yeah, Rocky, he's the greatest inspiration. I said, you know it was a movie, right? He's an actor. What? I thought he really, yeah. So we go and we bow down. We take pictures of the, at the statue of Rocky because it's, it's fun to do. But the Zach representation, everybody's got to go like this, right? But people think that is, that's, that's what Rocky's all about. That's what Jesus is saying here. Here's the son. He's the exact representation, a really perfect representation. He's not just a statue. And then five, he's sustaining all things through his powerful word. 
Now, you've seen the old Greek thing where Atlas is holding the world up like this. Well, that's not what Jesus is doing. He's maintaining the order of the universe by his spoken word. Does that blow your mind? His words are that powerful that he's maintaining everything together. He's sustaining things. He's upholding things that way. Another credential, number six, is he has, he has provided pur purification for our sins. You see, in the past, when he spoke to the ancestors, they had to sacrifice animals. And Jesus comes as the, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So at the cross, if you're not familiar with this, Jesus died on the cross for you and me, the sins that we inherit through Adam and Eve. And he purified our sins before he went to heaven on the cross. So if you want to live forever, know Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you want to get rid of all your guilt and purification of your sins, come to Jesus Christ this Christmas season. That dying on the cross. So after he did that, he sits down at the right hand of the majesty of his Father. That is a prominent place. Remember James and John when they went to Jesus and they said, hey, we want to be part of the kingdom. Can we sit next to you in the kingdom? That's a prominent in the ancient world to sit next to the king. And Jesus pretty, said, pretty much said, no, you've got to die and do all this kind of stuff. So they're like, ah, we're out of here, right? So purifying the sin, and then the last thing he does is sits down by the Father, and he's waiting. Now, he's just not sitting there waiting for all to come back. He's doing things, and he's holding the universe together. He, he's advocating for us to the Father when we sin. But here is Jesus sitting, and listen to this in Mark uh, 13, 32, another kind of warning to tell you in this world today. About the hour or the day, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father knows when he's coming back. So here's the Son, Jesus Christ, who is God. He doesn't know when he's coming back. I don't know how all that works. <laughs> he is deity, and yet he's, um, he doesn't know when he's coming back. But he's coming back one day. He's coming this Christmas season we celebrate as a baby, right? He grows up to be a man, as Brennan said, and he dies for our sin. But he's waiting. So I've been around in ministry for 30-some years. There's always a book that comes out. Jesus is coming back the next day. Uh, I remember back in 18, uh, not 18, I'm old, 1988, 1988, there's a book that came out, 88 Reasons for Why Jesus Christ is Coming Back in 88. Well, the best thing, I was at Dale Seminary, the best thing the professor said, as soon as he read the, uh, uh, did the book, it came out, published, everybody was all upset about it and talking about it. The best, best day is to debate the guy the day after because we're still here, all right? There always will be people that tell you that Jesus is coming back, again, False prophets, don't listen to them. Don't listen. To Jesus is coming back when Jesus is coming back. It is kind of um, reassuring that he's coming back, of course, but it's also a little bit like, hey, I got to get my act together. <laughs> Jesus could come back at any moment, at any time. And I, I love that. As, all, as I get older, I was like, Jesus, would you please come back when I'm stuck in traffic in Philly? And I'm sure there's, there's kids here and Karen, please come back for, before the exam. Please come back. And I do want Jesus to come back, but I also am concerned about my relatives, my friends, and perhaps people even in here that don't know Jesus yet. So that's the only reason I'm like, Jesus, hang on <laughs> a few more years, but he'll come back when he comes back. Again, talking about people that give you uh, false information, and, and we've got to be very careful again today. We had a death in our family, and uh, my wife's a teacher, and so there's a lady who was a psychic uh, at her school, and she would come up. This is a public school. She'd come up. The first time she came up to, to marry my wife, she said, I, I've got a word that your daughter has spoken to us. And so Mary's like, uh, she didn't know what to do, and she just walked away. And so we talked. We came back, and I said, the next time she says that. And she came back, and I really think this lady, this psychic, really thought she was helping us. So I don't think she was trying to be mean-spirited. But the second time she comes back, she says, I really have a word that your daughter has spoken to me, and I want to tell you what that word is. And Mary says, uh, we don't believe in that. Jesus Christ is the Savior, and we believe in him. Goodbye. And she just walked away, <laughs> which was excellent. She just said, we don't believe that. I've got to get out of here. We believe in Jesus Christ. She, you know, boom. And uh, so you've got to be careful in the last days. There are people who are going to tell you stories. And you know what's even worse? Not only the world out here and these false religions or philosophies, it's actually can filter into the church. It can filter into the church. And I'm not saying our church, but church at large. To say that people said, God told me. And I'm like, whatever you do, remember to take the Bible and weed that through before you say, oh, that's of God. Can he talk to people? Can he tell you some things? Sure. 
but I'm going to take that through the word of God and let the son know that. Real quickly, in the miracle of the message, I just want to put it in context where we are, and not spend too much time on this, but you've heard me say this before. Christmas time, uh, you're visiting with people and saying, I don't understand the Bible. Here's four ways you can, you can tell the story of the Bible. Creation, rescue, creation, fall, rescue, restoration. First few books of the, of the Bible, first few chapters of Genesis, one and two. Creation, wonderful creation stuff. Chapter three, we blow it. <laughs> Chapter three, we fall. Chapter 3, we inherit the sins and we turn away from God. The rest of the Bible is a rescue plan up to the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation talks about the restoration that we will restore. The earth will be restored to that beautiful creation thing again one day. But right now, we're in the rescue plan. We're in the rescue plan and he's come and he's spoken through Jesus Christ. Jesus is God's final revelation and his finest representation. So how will you respond to Jesus this season? God has spoken. And are you listening? He does speak through his word. He speaks through his Holy Spirit. I have four kids, and when they were younger, we were in our basement. And our basement has cinder block walls, and it has air ducts and stuff like that down there. And we're playing, and all of a sudden, I hear the voice of God. And it's this. Hello, Dad, Cameron. This is, your, this is uh, God, and he's saying that you're going to have another child. And I'm like, first of all, it doesn't call me dad. Second of all, I recognize the voice that was my son, Dylan, speaking through the vents upstairs to say we're going to have more children. Now, I realized there was a little bit of panic that God would tell me I'm going to have more kids because I had four, and that's enough, <laughs> right? So sometimes we hear the voice of God, but listen, I recognized who? Dylan. I recognized my son's voice. The funny thing is, now he's just had a baby, so ha, ha, ha to him, all right? <laughs> See, so you recognize, and the Bible says in John 10, 27, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them, and they follow me. So spending time in the Word, coming to church, talking to Jesus Christ. Jesus' final revelation, finest representation, how has he spoken? I'm just going to look at a couple of his followers, because it's interesting, Jesus never wrote a book. Jesus didn't start a university. Jesus didn't have a podcast. What he spoke, his followers wrote down, and most of that in the Gospels. The whole Bible talks about Jesus, but the Gospels talk about this. So here's Paul, who was really against Jesus, if you know his story. And he says this, but God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I work with people in the city and all over the place that are not lovely people. By society's standards, well, we're not lovely people, are we? apart from God. But listen to this. People say, you don't, you, you don't have to get your act together before you come to Jesus Christ. You come to Jesus Christ and he'll help you get your act together. Does that make sense? So you think you got to get polished and look good and all this kind of stuff to come to church. You think you got to drop this, drop that. Come to Jesus Christ and he'll help you overcome those addictions. He'll help you overcome those, the anger. He'll help you overcome those sins. It doesn't mean it's done, gone with, but he'll overcome that, help you overcome that with your life. And that's what Paul says. Then he says this, as we listen to different voices, Acts 4, 12, salvation is found in no one else. There's no, one other, uh, no other name under heaven, given, uh, under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And Peter says that in Acts. So we get to uh, go to Philly, and we do a food distribution in South Philly. Now, South Philly has changed. It used to be um, uh, more Irish and Jewish population. Now there's a lot of refugees, Asian refugees there. And so the neighborhood has changed. So we do a food distribution with a church there. And then we get a cheesesteak, of course. And then we go to the Buddhist temple, of course. <laughs> I've had an opportunity when I take college students. We usually go to this Buddhist temple, which is right there off of a park. And I stand outside and we talk about the statues. We talk about Buddhism, philosophy, theology. And we talk about Christianity. One day when I'm there with 30 students from our gap year program that we we partner with, um, the construction guys who are Cambodian said, come on in. I'm sure the monk will want to meet with you. I'm like, I doubt it. <laughs> I said, I have 30 students. I was kind of, kind of avoiding it. Come on in. I said, okay. So we go in and we spend time with the monk explaining Buddhism to us and his philosophy of life. And basically when it comes down to it, and I told the students, let's be polite. We're going to learn to be learners. We know what we believe. 
We want to hear what he believes. And since that time, I've been there about five times with group. Pastor Brian's been with us with the group, and we, we do our thing, then we go in there and we listen, then we come back out and we debrief about what's different about the philosophies. And I'll tell you right now, Buddhism isn't it, okay? It's a self-effort type of, of, of belief in that way. But uh, on one side, too, is when you're talking to people that don't believe that you believe, that we believe as Christians, please be listeners. Best thing I've learned working at Princeton and college students is I'm going to listen to your story first and then I'll speak. Hey, what's your spiritual beliefs? Where'd you come from? Let them talk. One, it's polite. <laughs> Two, you get to know where they are spiritually and then you could present the gospel and truth to them. So that's what we do. So as Jesus, now we get to Jesus' own words and Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life and no man comes unto the Father but by me. Again, we get to do street evangelism with the Rock Ministries. Rock Ministries is a boxing ministry, which is also a church now, Calvary Chapel Church down there. But they've been down there for 30 years. The, um, the pastor was, an, uh, was in the union back in the, the day, and he was a boxer. Started a boxing ministry and helping kids in his addictions ministry. So we're in a park called McPherson Square, which is really called Needle Park. Everybody calls it Needle Park because there's needles everywhere. A lot of guys and ladies doing drugs. So... We go up to a guy who's laying down. I figured, he's laying down. He's not going to run away from me. <laughs> so I said, how you doing, dude? We talk a little bit. I said, can you get out of it? Can you get home? He goes, I, I'm not welcome at home. I said, oh, I'm sorry. I said, Rock Ministries, we can help you get there. That's a good idea. And then out of the blue, he goes, I should try Buddhism. I'm like, I'm getting old. I said, Buddha's dead. I said, Buddha's dead, and you're probably not going to make it to the end of the night staying in this park. And I said, but Jesus is alive. And he loves you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. And he goes, all right, man, I, I got you. <laughs> and we, we talked a little bit more, and then we had to, to move on. But Jesus is the only way. He's trying drugs. He's trying to get away from things. And I get it. I get it why people want to do that stuff. They want to get out of the stuff of the world, but it's not the way to go. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And then he says this. If you've been at older football games, people would hold up John th uh, 3.16. Remember that in the back? And he says this, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There's the gospel. That's the message of the season. Yes, he spoke in different ways in the past. He spoke in this way and he continues his rescue plan. And if you want to tell people about the rescue plan, if you remember one verse, John 3, 16. He came because he loves you and me. It's the greatest summary of the good news we could have. And then Jesus, if you think about it, the miracle of the message of these two verses too. And if you remember what's happening here, uh, Jesus is on earth, God in human form and deity. And, uh, and a Pharisee comes to him and says, hey, Pharisees, remember they're the ones that like the Old Testament. He said, what's the best law? And there's like 600 laws. So he's trying to trick Jesus. And Jesus, being Jesus, quotes the Old Testament. This is really from the Old Testament. He takes parts of Leviticus and says this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And he adds a little bit then from Leviticus. This is the first and greatest commandment. Then he says this, the second's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. This is the way I spoke in the Old Testament. Let me summarize it for you. Love God, love people. That's pretty basic, isn't it? If someone said to you about Christianity, you can give them the four stages of the Bible. But it is that. We are to love God and to love people. And the people I meet are not always lovely. The people you meet, maybe even relatives, are not always lovely. But if you remember that God loves you and what he has done in your life, you'll have grace and you'll have mercy for those who need that in their lives. So the last few years, I have been working with Productive Lives. And uh, I've, done, I've been a pastor for 24 years at a church. I was on staff here for a while, working at Princeton campus ministries, and God really moved in my heart in different circumstances to start Productive Lives, and Productive Lives, as I said, is a training organization, and we really believe we want to train people to serve other people. We're not starting a church, I'm not starting an addiction ministry, I'm not starting another ministry in Philly, I'm coming alongside those who are doing those things well, and having people serve, because they need people to serve, plus, when you serve, if you serve here at the church, my wife and I do the kids classes, we do She's on women's ministry. We do other stuff here. When you serve, you really do feel better. 
you should be serving because Jesus Christ came to serve and not to be served. And so I want to leave you with, um, if you want to know more about Productive Life, we go down all the time. We do different trips. I'd uh, love to have you come. But I would love you to pray for us in Productive Life. My card's out on the back table there. But I want to leave you with a video, a video that summarizes that the Son has, has spoken in these last days. And he has given his life, and he's changed people's perspective and transform their life. So watch the video and you'll see what happens. suburbs but in the suburbs every group I've been with we've taken down to the to the city to expose them to to life outside of uh, I call it the bubble <laughs> a lot of us live in uh, comfort and I want to say someone said I'm not sure who said it but it's to uh, comfort the afflicted and then afflict the comfortable uh, well, I'm just trying to Well, one of the things we're doing today is a food giveaway, and uh, we work through the uh, Philadelphia Food Bank, et cetera, so we keep all of our practices good with that, but it's also uh, building the relationships with people and giving them food, taking care of the material need, and then looking to take care of their spiritual man. Philadelphia is a diverse city, it's a great city, historic city, but there are pockets of poverty and addiction and so uh, some great need and we want to come alongside the people that are doing that. God has been so good to me. Some of the things that happened in my life were just unbelievable and I didn't think that there was an answer. And God rescued me. I suffer with anxiety and depression, and I recently got diagnosed with bipolar. So I learned instead of taking the energy and spiraling into something negative, into something that isn't righteous, I'm learning to pray and give it to God. Uh, my name is Donald Trubbett. I lost my wife uh, probably about eight months ago or so. Uh, I've been coming to church since before that even still now. And this particular church here has become my second family. I'm very happy. I love all my people here. If you want to see your life count, really make a difference for Christ, uh, this is a great place to be. I, lo I always say that uh, Jesus was walking the face of the earth today, as particularly if he was walking in the United States, I think he would be in Kensington. You cannot live here so just in this city without Christ. There's no way to talk about Did, did you hear the last thing she said? You cannot live in this city without Jesus Christ. Um, and his, his mission for us was to bring Jesus. He, he doesn't just, he brings us along, but he has us lead others into that. And so um, as we're up here, we have Cam coming here to speak. It's not just to fill a speaking spot. He gave me a Sunday off, but that's great. But... but <laughs> we really believe in and we know cam and we know what god's been doing through him and when cam left his last position and he came into this one i knew what he was doing personally financially and all of that and so i want to not embarrass him but stand up here and say we as a church support him financially and some of us support him individually and we're going to continue to support him through prayer and so we wanted you to know the ministry 
that he's involved in, and I do believe it would be a place where Jesus would be walking in the midst of Kensington. And so um, we are grateful for the ministry you're doing, Cam and Mary, uh, as you guys serve there. So thank you for speaking today. Let's pray and yeah, commit God's blessing to them. Lord, thank you for Cam and Mary. Thank you for productive lives, the board, um, the building that you gave them. Um, but Lord, with all those blessings, the road ahead is still so uncertain in this time in which there are so many forces fighting against uh, your work, God. It's a spiritual battle, but then there's an economic battle. There's a physical battle. We pray for your provision, and we will participate with you, God. And so we ask your blessing on them. We commit them before you as they serve in Kensington, as they do the work that you've called them to do. Thank you for Cam and his heart in doing all of this. And we ask your blessing on them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank Thanks. You, Have a great week. Thank you.